Good, Good evening, everyone. Today is the final session of the Esprit Analytical Club. We are summarizing this year. Uh, we're planning to uh, have a session for two hours. For the first hour, we'll uh, be asking questions, and in the second hour, we'll be answering them. Among our speakers today is Andrei Kazakiewicz, um, who is a PhD in political science and director of the political sphere of the Institute. Katerina Bornyukova, academic director of Birok, Artyom Schreibman, political analyst and non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Moscow Center, Peter Rutkovsky, director of the Belarusian Institute for Strategic Studies, and uh, Anais Marin, UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Belarus, and Pavel Slunkin, fellow of the European Council on European Relations. I'd like to remind you that we're recording the discussion. We apply in the Chatham rules. So if you want to say something that uh, should not be quoted, please warn us in advance. Other members of the discussion will be will know that they should quote you on this. And also to remind you that we have a simultaneous interpretation available. So feel free to use the English track if you wish so. Please raise your questions in the chat if you want to ask a question. I would like to give floor to my colleague, Vadim Majeka. Hello, uh, everyone. Good evening, good day, good morning, depending on the time zone. I would like to welcome everyone once again. I'm glad to see everyone here today, uh, everyone that we have invited, because today, we have a uh, special expert club session. We're not selecting any particular narrow topic today, but it's important to understand, um, to discuss many issues that uh, took place, many uh, things that took place and happened this year. We have a lot of experts, so I, I would like to ask everyone to be brief because we don't have much time. Our time is not limited. The questions that uh, we formulated and we came up with in the announcement, we were planning to discuss the forecast for 2022. Let's briefly discuss what happened in 2021. What do you think? is um, most important here. We've seen a lot of things happening. It's a very important year. Uh, concluding 2020, we said that 2020 was uh, uh, remarkable, significant, and we thought that 2021 would be comparable. Uh, what happened for you in 2021? What were the main things, benchmark highlights of 2021? Let's be briefly ask everyone and i suggest we move this same in the same order that we introduced people so uh let's start with andrei kazakevich what are the main conclusions of the 2021 indeed uh it was a very interesting year just like we promised it would be i think the main conclusion of 2021 is i think the fact that uh the political model that lasted from 1996 to 2020 um, finally collapsed. I think at the end of the 2020 already, there were a lot of expectations, particularly um, people uh, I mean, the authorities thought that many things would go back to the way they used to be, that the system could regenerate itself, could overcome the threats and uh, go on living and developing the way it was developing before. But the year 2021 showed that it was a false, that the new revolutionary notes uh, can be heard because in many ways, the public, uh, the 
social institute that uh, were forming in Belarus in the last 25 years. They collapsed. I think about a decade ago, people were some people were saying that the Belarusian social state came to an end, and uh, then we will have another model developing. Now I uh, can say that it's we uh, witnessing the end of the Belarusian official political model, the authoritarian model that uh, uh, started forming in 1996. Obviously, it, it would be replaced by something else. Uh, it's not clear where it uh, will all go, but uh, there's no way back, I believe. Uh, why did it happen? First, because the public political structures uh, were purged. It was an unprecedented church uh, purge. Uh, the pressure was unprecedented. We didn't have anything coming close to it in the past. The relationship with the West was destroyed and the attempts Uh, were made to create a strategic autonomy in the, in, Minsk, in, in the region for Minsk. There was a crisis in the relationship with the West. It's the deepest we've seen so far. Uh, more robot builders became a threat for the regional security. Even though before that, Belarus highlighted uh, uh, the image of being, although an authoritarian, but very dependable and uh, non-problematic neighbor. Now it turned out it was false. It was, now Belarus is a direct threat to Poland, uh, not so much for Latvia, but uh, the same logic is obvious. We're seeing more and more Belarus uh, being seen as a threat for Ukraine since uh, it's uh, very much uh, doing the same thing as the Russian war machine doing. It is something new, it's not something we've seen before. The balance of inside the ruling class was uh, severely disrupted. I mean, the people who make decisions. A lot of Slaviki or law enforcement Uh, people were introduced or implanted in, at that level. Again, the we're witnessing unprecedented purges there. This is a new phenomenon. As in uh, new people will be uh, introduced into the agencies, uh, which will break the balance between the interest groups that uh, we saw uh, in Belarus before that. Now we're witnessing the tradition period. We don't know where it will go, but it will definitely not look like it used to. The relationship between the, the people and the authorities has, has changed. This trend started in 2020 and uh, continued in 2021. The authorities don't care about the majority of, of the, about the, uh, the people. They're not looking for the new majority they lost in 2020. They are rather aim, aiming at consolidating their minority, trying to impose their own vision on the society, their vision of the politics, the economy, the culture, and so on. My last point is precisely about this. It is that before 2020, the authoritarian regime was very much a populist in the sense that was adjusting to the um, expectations of others. We're mostly doing this at the end, at the beginning of this period, and not so much at the end of the period, but it was important for them. But now this seems like the logic is different. They have their own opinions, their own feelings. 
they want to not to adjust to the majority to the people their opinions and desires but to reformat all this mood all this mood the policy of the society i think it's a it, uh, there's no capacity for that uh, but the attempts uh, undertaken and a lot has been done for this particularly in 2021 thank you very much andre uh will continue with katerina i believe each and every of you understands who can focus on what but you know we'll probably focus on the economy what are the economic conclusions of 2021. Our bride was 2021. Indeed, uh, this uh, year I'll be responsible for the positive thing. The positive thing we had in 2021 was happening mostly in the economic sphere, thanks to the export miracle. Uh, despite the expectations of the crisis, we received the economic growth. And uh, according to the statements of many authorities, this year in the economy became one of the best in the last 10 12 years some say uh, it was even 15 years indeed for you to better understand the state of our economy this is what are the best year of uh, looks over the last 10 years according to the latest data the GDP will grow for a little more than two percent while our neighbors like russia ukraine uh, will have the gdp grow uh, up to four uh, percent ukrainians say this is not great and uh, we could do better poland and lithuania will grow by about five percent and belarus will grow by two percent eventually which is a great uh the real uh profits uh of the population will grow about two percent the consumption is not growing people are not showing the mm, earning more uh, they're spending more because they expect the situation to get worse the internal investment level is going down and the number of investment total investment went down by eight percent which compared to 2020 which wasn't the best there was the most successful in terms of investment the economy is uh, didn't really find but I, uh, I i cannot say it's doing great out of the interesting trends or events i could highlight uh, the change of the economic policy towards the, the private sector of the economy i believe the uh, this contradiction between what used to be and what we have now uh, uh, we saw in february when the first the ministry of economy presented the economic program that was um, drafted before the political crisis uh, and where the program to support SMEs plays a great role in development of the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and innovations and uh, while, uh, while one of the business uh, union representatives was speaking Lukashenko said that one of the major conditions for the public sector was the political loyalty and uh, he showed the the private sector its new place in the new economic policy also we don't see any tragic things happening the private business did not was has not uh yet tr been treated harshly as the society the rest of the society has been but we are witnessing some aggressively negative changes in the policies like the policy in the tax code uh, that are not were not really discussed by anyone and uh, uh, adopted in the last moment until the last minute they was not clear how they will work how this transition um, 
to the non-simplified tax regime will happen in 2023. And I think the liberals that were present in the government, they understand now that the private sector in this political situation will not be able to, um, uh, will not be a growth driver and they shouldn't be uh, pr protected therefore. The last big trend is connected with sanctions. We spoke a lot about them, whether they work or not, this, uh, uh, their effect on the economy has been playing, uh, has been, and uh, will they will play a major role in the future economic trends. Thank you, Katerina. Let's move on, uh, Artyom Schreibman. I'm, I'm not inviting Artyom to every session of the Expert Analytical Club. But let's hear Artyom now. What was the most important thing? Well, it's interesting for me to uh, know why you're not involving me in this session. So every political club, I think a political crisis should be divided into other stages than that of the uh, of a calendar year. While 2020 was a, a failure of many illusions and uh, many um, Belarusians had their hopes destroyed. Uh, in 2020, it happened the same with the expert society, the expert community. Many of us, and me in particular, we were convinced uh, that that uh, this cannot last too long because it's too expensive. It uh, makes the system unbalanced. This state is not uh, static, but the what is long enough. The Belarusian regime showed that they can exist in such situation for long enough without any external signs of the serious destabilization. So in the year of 2021, was the year when there were basically no protest, when uh, the internal purges were grown exponentially in waves. It didn't lead to the fact that the economy uh, suffered greatly. Uh, we have just heard Katerina tell us about that. Uh, without expert miracle, we would see some consequences of political crisis in the economic sphere, but overall, the system that did not sustain any internal earthquake in the sense that uh, did not switch to the fundamentally new format of uh, keeping location can power. While in, in the past, just like Andrei said, and many other others said, the social contract was holding on the, on the mix of uh, carrots and sticks uh, applied at, in different proportion at different times. Now, I believe this balance has moved towards sticks, not because there are no uh, carrots, but because the system is now based mostly on the violence as a systemic factor. Uh, It's very difficult to keep this level of violence because the, uh, and uh, also it's very difficult to bring it down because there are a lot of agencies that are interested in this. They feel uh, that their current situation will be undermined if uh, they asked to go back to the f uh, format prior to, that was existed prior to 2020. And in many ways, in order to turn back this trend, it will not be enough not to give orders because this repressive machine is uh, very much autonomous, is reproducing itself. There should be a clear cut order to stop it, for it to stop. And for this, we need some external exogenous shock that will show to Lukashenko 
that uh, this policy has uh, many more disadvantages that he had imagined. It could be something economic, could be some uh, waves of sporadic waves of uh, peaks of violence, like the case of Zelta, but um, on a more regular basis, or it could be uh, the level of sanctions that uh, even today's authorities will not be able to tolerate. But this way or the other, until such exogenous crisis that will put into question the current status quo emerge, it will be difficult to find a factor that will crash this trend. Uh, the system can not become uh, kinder by itself because uh, uh, it will simply uh, not sustain it, considering the Yeah. Uh, но для Запада чем нарушение региональной стабильности? То есть те пакеты санкций, которые принимались за нарушение прав человека, за репрессии, они на фоне даже тех дырявых санкций, которые принимались после самолета Ryanair и после миграционного кризиса, они меркнут. Это означает, что мы видим приоритеты. Да? Мы видим, что поднятая планка насилия внутри страны, она такова, что можно выносить просто абсолютно сталинские сроки, можно заниматься таким ежедневным милицейским садизмом на камеру, и это не приводит к какому-то международному возмущению уже, потому что Лукашенко уже находится в той зоне а, международных раздражителей, в котором ему нужно генерировать какие-то новые региональные кризисы для того, чтобы а, навлечь на себя новый гнев а, там, Евросоюза или США. Я не то чтобы не верю в его способности это делать, я как раз таки уверен, что его Uh, по поводу ненаклоняемости, желания постоянно... I believe that uh, the fact that he is escalating the site and uh, I believe he gives us a new uh, ways to become more and more spiraling. But I think in, for the uh, for internal policy, uh, it's bad and uh, the existing taboos and the absence of the red lines and they increase the amount of violence i think it's a very dramatic situation well i was that's uh, in a nutshell all from me i believe there could be some sociologists uh, among their audience members. I'll touch upon the public trends noticed by me and some of my some of the experts. We see the division or delimitation of the authorities and the, uh, the uh, members of the society, the non-loyal part of the society, to be exact. The authorities remain, uh, it consists of the loyalist. Uh, it's becoming uh, less and less easy to work in the state enterprises if you are being unloyal. And it can be witnessed by the purges that took place at the end of the 2021. I believe there are hundreds of thousands of people that were laid off. It is one of the um, biggest trends of 2021. It is that the authorities are consolidating this sense. They're purging the internal incidents, dissidents. They could give it some illusion of stabilization, internal ideological stabilization. Uh, we all understand that the mechanism, the feedback at the political level and uh, at the technical level, they are disappearing. And the authorities of the state companies and the regions and the production sectors, 
the central original bodies more and more, there are more and more remain people who are afraid to say out loud that they disagree and uh, this will undermine the governance of the of the country at the political and all other levels and i witnessed two opposing trends uh, that are uh, actually could be contradictory contradicting but we see what we uh, a growing number of people who voted in favor of depolitization who are tired or never interested in politics and after this a wave of the political activism in 2021 the authorities are uh, uh, going back to the norm because their norm uh, existed for many years the 2020 was a more of a much of an aberration the number of the uh, depoliticized members of the site is growing we it's witnessed by the surveys and the number of people who are uh, living in uh, telegram channels and youtube channels that are deemed mm, uh, criminal by the state also shows this also there are figures shown that some uh, the nucleus of the protest and the bulwark of Lukashenko, they begin becoming more and more polarized. Uh, they could be going down in uh, terms of numbers, and uh, but the polarization, the trend of polarization is continuing. It is another dangerous trend because the, the other party uh, is more and more perceived as a, not just political opponent, but as a reprehensive of the other that have no place in the future Belarus and uh, at the level of intellectual discussion we understand that is bad and we should can uh, build an inclusive model of society but let's be an objective if we move away if we uh, look what is happening in those two groups we'll see that the level of animosity that uh, was never witnessed in Belarus during its sovereignty period. That's it for me. Back to you, Vadim. Indeed, I, uh, it's very interesting to see what the attitude of people as to the members of the other group. It's definitely not the same way it was two or three years ago. But it's real. It's the reality. Thank you, Artem. Now I'd like to give floor to Piotr Rutkowski, director of the Belarusian Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, this morning, Piotr presented uh, the research on values transformation, and before that, they introduced the yearbook. What are the main patterns? The main conclusions of 2021, Piotr? What caught your attention? A lot was said by the people who spoke before me, so I'll add some points. There will be three first, that in the conditions of the system becoming more Stalinist-like, people left the streets. It may be sad, but it's a natural reaction. It's, health, it's a healthy reaction as more and more people get charged and uh, some people died particularly the protesters in this respect we see the situ the protest subsiding but i repeat many people that uh, are still unhappy with the status quo particularly those that Mr. Schreiber noted and mentioned this uh, dissatisfaction trend remains. We can also witness that Belarusians are ignoring the state propaganda. All the various data showed that the audience of the state mass media is going down drastically. The same is true about the trust towards the state media outlets. 
this is very symptomatic. This will make very difficult uh, and complicates the regime's survival process. Secondly, when the let's talk about the secret programs signed with Russia. Apparently, they uh, involve some uh, steps towards Russia. The Kremlin will probably support Lukashenko in the near steps. I guess they involve some concessions. From, uh, but these concessions, they uh, threaten the regime even more. I believe that Lukashenko will be a, a, the captain of the ship, not for long. I believe in the long term, the Kremlin would not want the person in charge of Belarus who will be compromising the Kremlin's policy and who will be will have such a small legitimacy inside the state among the people. I guess this is a problem for the Kremlin. The third point is connected with the th second one. In the near future, we'll probably see Boris Grislov, the Russian Silovik, and uh, well-established politician. Uh, it will be difficult uh, to fool this person by the Belarusian side. I believe the Kremlin, by doing this, will uh, step up the integration process with Belarus. Summarizing what has been said, uh, Mr. Schreiber rightly said that that many thought that many people thought that for such a long time regime will not hold on one of the similar analogies uh, can be seen in the polish 80s not so long ago uh, there was the anniversary of the 40 years that passed since there's those events in poland Lech Valenza was actually released 10 months into his detention. In terms of in the situation of Belarus, it has happened, uh, has been happening for longer. I mean, the martial law in Poland, there are three pillars of authoritarianism. Yeah. The legitimacy, the social contract, preservation, some economic standards. The second pillar is the repression. The third pillar is uh, the attitude of elites. If one of these pillars collapses, there are probably issues with the third pillar, not in the sense that the elites uh, uh, traders for the current regime, but they are leaving. The people, the professionals are leaving. Indeed, it's very difficult to hold on in such situation. Well, if the economic miracle continues and not some other panacea will be found, if the social contract is reformatted, it could be 
combined with repression. But the question is how much the first pillar will be partially renewed. or can be renewed. I believe that it's a matter of time when the, we see the next significant change. Thank you very much, Peter. Artem already spoke about the the number of the victims among the protesters has gone down and the fact that kgb officer died uh, in the zelta case was important indeed the fact that uh, this wasn't the best kind of news but uh, from the point of view protesters mood it's the uh, two cases of zeltzer and ashurok that influenced the situation kgb officer died in the zeltzer case i believe he was a victim of the situation indeed we're human that uh, i believe also believe that he was a victim but do we have an ace marine now with us glad to hear and see you let's discuss the step up of repression and how it uh, affected the country inside and outside thank you very much um apologize if there'll be technical issue i'll be speaking in english please if you want to listen to an ace in russian please select the appropriate option you can select the russian track you can do the same using the smartphone thank you very much um so from my perspective i'll speak mostly uh, first as a, a special rapporteur of the un on the situation of human rights in belarus what we have seen in the past year is uh, basically as uh, you uh, uh, labeled it in the presentation of of this uh, event a year of counter-revolution and uh, which has been targeting um, all people who have been taking part in the protest but also and this is my main point uh, there is an ongoing purge against uh, civil society as we know 300 um, ngos have been liquidated since the summer and uh, when we look at the last uh, sentences uh, by criminal courts uh, in, in, in homil last week it even looks like uh, some of the sentencing of um, uh, political oppositionists looks like a personal revenge by uh, the uh, president uh, self-proclaimed president of, of uh, Belarus uh, against all kind of dissidents. Uh, let me uh, stress also that um, apart from these uh, several uh, condemnations of, of last week against uh, Tsikhanovsky, Statkevich, but others who've been condemned to 14 to 18 years in prison, four anarchist, anarchists were sentenced from 18 to 20 years in prison um, and the number of political prisoners keeps on increasing as we speak it's about to reach 1000 uh, uh, people uh, just as a comparison this is uh, more than twice as much as in russia where according to vladimir karamurzaj there is something like 415 political prisoners in um, in russia um, also, the, uh, we have noticed how the um, legislative arm of the um, 
regime has been tightening uh, the screws using more and more this uh, legislation against extremism in order to prosecute uh, people simply for expressing their personal opinions um, and uh, in as an example is also the fact that the um, members of parliament have tightened criminal liability for involvement in unregistered and disbanded political parties, NGOs, religious communities and foundations, which is a further restriction to the right to freedom of association and in practice leads us back to before the last reform where, uh, which um, repelled the uh, infamous article 193 of the uh, of the criminal court so we can say even that this partial freedom that existed when uh, participation in an unregistered organization would lead to uh, prosecution uh, in administrative courts meaning fines and eventually detention up to 15 days in prison now we see that more and more we will be go back to a situation where participating in an unregistered organization can lead you to prison for several years um, so of course what we see is that um, the repression has been escalating there is a general climate of lawlessness and impunity for the human rights violations which have been recorded for the past year and i have in mind the most serious ones notably uh, of course uh, murders um, enforced disappearances and torture and ill treatment uh, also i would like to stress that um, i think it's important since the repression has been going on for over 18 months now to um to, to remind that um beyond the fate of the almost 1,000 political prisoners, we are talking about thousands and thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people who are victims of repression, if we understand it more in a more large uh, understanding. People have been uh, with uh, victims of threats and intimidation at their workplace uh, from the last records that we uh, have been receiving of the past weeks. Several people are forced to resign from uh, when they are working in state owned enterprise at the university or they are having the unpleasant privilege of a personal conversation with KGB to remind them that uh, um, taking part in the activities, uh, taking part, part in ag extremist activities and nowadays uh, following a telegram channel, which is labeled tele as extremist can uh, bring about criminal liability as well. So there is this general climate of, of uh, intimidation and fear, a climate of repression, which uh, has um, led also to um, the forced exile of um, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Belarusians over the past uh, 18 months. Uh, as a mandate holder, I'm trying now to gather the figures about this, uh, this first exile because it might amount to what we call a crime of deportation, which is a crime against humanity uh, by international um, uh, human rights law standards. So this is uh, just to uh, remind of um, what will be my priority for, for 2022 as, the, as a rapporteur will be uh, um, gathering evidence of the, uh, the this first exile, the, thousand, the migrants, um, the Belarusian migrants. Um, however, I would like to address one of the questions that uh, uh, Vadim had um, asked for, for our panel today uh, regarding assessing the, uh, the, the Western uh, foreign policy and including sanctions. As you know, at the UN, I'm not uh, allowed to use the term of, of sanctions. We talk of unilateral coercive measures, only sanctions uh, uh, pursuant of um, Chapter 7 of the, of the UN Charter uh, are deemed legitimate. But um, in uh, either way, the situation with Belarus at the UN has been extremely difficult. Uh, it's difficult for me to fight inertia and obstruction from a number of uh, countries, and I won't need to name them. Um, but um, the what we have seen also during this year is how Mr. Lukashenko has gradually evolved from a rogue into potentially a, a terrorist uh, um, a state terrorism. Meaning I'm, I'm having in mind here, of course, the um, 
uh, first landing of the Ryanair flight in uh, on 23rd of May, and in recent months, the instrumentalization of uh, third country migrants for hybrid warfare purpose in order to, to, to blackmail the, the West, to divide the EU, and even to, to sow discord even within uh, Polish society. And I, I happen to live in Poland, so I could see the, the impact of, of, of this and the fact that it further actually um, the situation with the migrants crisis at the border with Belarus uh, has uh, actually given a chance to the um, uh, authoritarian government of Poland to also, you know, get some some international support at the end of the day, some EU support for its very uh, um, heavy handed uh, uh, handling of the of the situation and uh, possibly um, ill treatment of, of the migrants. And Merkel has given the impression that she surrendered to the blackmail because uh, she had this dialogue uh, with, with Mr. Lukashenko that led to ending uh, the, the, the crisis. So of course, as special rapporteur, I myself have to advocate for dialogue, even if it's a dialogue of the deaf with, with the government, which doesn't recognize my mandate and cooperate with it. Um, however, what I see happening with this um, uh, multiplication of, of scandals, of, of uh, uh, foreign policy, international relations scandals, is that um, Mr. Lukashenko at some point might uh, actually be labeled a, a threat to international peace and, and regional security. And that would, in a way, perhaps uh, uh, give us um, open avenues for a new look on uh, to the, the, the situation in this international dimension and uh, what can be uh, done about it. And uh, I'm very um, hopeful that even though we can advocate for some kind of mediation or, or uh, dialogue, I can see some countries even within the EU could uh, be at the could be the mediators. Uh, if it's needed to speak with Mr. Lukashenko, for example, to avoid uh, a gas crisis uh, next winter in uh, in Europe. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I think that it's important that the international community uh, follows very closely um, the uh, human rights violations, which continue the torture, which continues the impunity, which is still there, and which, uh, again, since it has led to uh, the forced exile of so many people, this could amount again uh, against the backdrop of what happened in the case of the Rohingya who fled um, uh, uh, Myanmar and went to, to Bangladesh. Uh, this could amount to a, a crime of deportation, which is potentially a crime against humanity. I will stop here. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's thanks a lot, Anais, and especially for the, uh, especially when you compare the number of political prisoners in Belarus and Russia, I uh, think it's always a, like a big impression because we compare like the total numbers between uh, the small Belarus and so big Russia, and, and the numbers is high in Belarus. I think it's it's like it's like a great image. Uh, it's like a great image to to understand the situation when you look, even just look around and just the numbers. So thanks for that again. And then I to we're switching into Russian Belarusian. We're moving towards the international agenda. I would like to give floor to Pavel Slunkin, who is a fellow of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Also, we have people who left the system. I mean, the we used to work uh, in the 30s, among the 30s. Pavel, let's discuss the foreign policy conclusions of 2021. In fact, this is a big challenge. It's uh, difficult to speak after the wonderful statements since we're talking about the same things. Since I'm supposed to sum it up, I um, will not be politologically precise, but uh, I'll use metaphors. In this sense, the year of 2021, 2021 is associated with uh, our hopes of going down to earth. 
and the metaphorical symbol here is the landing of the Ryanair flight. When I'm talking about uh, this, I mean the heightened ex expectations among Belarusians that uh, were enjoyed by them in December 2020. Uh, some Belarusians expected a hot spring uh, that Bel the regime will fall down and uh, will have a, a different Belarus very soon. We know that never happened. It has not happened yet. In the same way, we can remember about the repression. Uh, about a year ago, we were surprised when some uh, uh, election campaign meetings were not approved, when people were detained in stores. And I remember when we were speaking about the bottom, uh, we thought that there was no bottom. And uh, we thought it was, uh, we now think that it's a very liberal attitude when people are detained in store. And the new normality when we, where we find ourselves in it looks awful. Uh, without a doubt, there's no bottom in this respect. I don't know if we morally and mentally are catching up with uh, each of this bottom that we go through. Now, when the uh, Defense lawyers are labeled as terrorists. Um, mass media sharing um, factual information with us are labeled extremist. Brings us to the conclusion that our illusions that the regime would not do this or, or somebody else's illusions. I never had such illusions. I never expected many things, but uh, globally, I mean, gen in general, I was not much surprised by what happened. Um, I'm simply angered by this. And our current status quo shows that there's no price that the regime is not ready to pay. And Lukashenko privately, personally, is not ready to pay uh, in order to stay in power. One of the conclusions, if not the year, but uh, that the uh, conclusion that should be enjoyed by the majority of the Belarusians. Another expectations that did not uh, come through was the negotiations that were supposed to be held in May, but never happened. It's important to note the pluses and minuses of that. On the one hand, the political uh, subjects, I mean, the political leaders inside the country were not being able to gain uh, their victories inside Belarus, but still they managed to retain importance at the international arena. I don't know if we should have, we should we expect the results that uh, headquarters of Stikhanovsk and their partners uh, in the coalition achieved uh, 18 years after. But at the same time, the negotiations will be held with the political subjects. The regime wants to take part in the negotiations, but it will be holding them not with the Babarika or Tikhanovsky headquarters, but with the countries like the Germany or the United States. They can indeed define the situation and affect the situation inside the country. And of course, the sanctions policy and the international positioning of the Belarusian regime. So the illusion that uh, that if we may make a signal that Lukashen to Lukashenko that we want to communicate with you, but for this you need to have some leverage. But if we give this right to somebody in Berlin and Washington or Paris, we need to understand that to control them, we cannot, we cannot control them. And uh, some agreements, they may be disappointing to us. It's, we shouldn't perceive it as negotiations. It is the Belarusian society and the offices that represent them will that they will be excluded from these negotiations. Talking about the people and the community, 
society. Many, many have mentioned about that. Vadim and Andre spoke about this when you were asked about the uh, sub, uh, the status of the subject of the Belarusian society. I think it changed in 2020. I will give the football metaphor. In 2020, Belarusian uh, people became the, the Belarusian Messi, who took to the field and could win if uh, if it wasn't uh, fouled against. But the fact that the the, the Belgian Messi is still there in the field, even watching the game, is very much a problem for the regime, and which is to, which is doing everything not for this Belgian Messi not to come back into the field. And the main task that the Belarusian society is facing is to retain this potential. And to survive the unending repressions. The final match will depend on this. Here I mean the political crisis. A lot has been said about the economy. There's another fantasy that many Belarusians had that will be taken off the streets, but the economy will force Lukashenko to make concessions or will force a hungry, hungry hunger mutinies. But we saw the opposite thing happened, even though we were not growing as fast as our neighbors, uh, but there are no signs of the short-term economic collapse. So I believe we should remember that the economy as the factor that could provoke the uh, political uh, political events should not be hoped for. Another conclusion I wanted to mention is that black swans can only play for in favor of the uh, democratic society, but also it can play into the hands of uh, Lukashenko's regime. It happened with the economic growth. This is exactly what happened in 2021 in relatively difficult conditions. Well, we, if we speak about the international arena, we'll see that Russia and those Russian relationship that they show that over the last 18 years, 18 months, excuse me, 18 months, that uh, we uh, made a lot of concessions. We can talk about the joint programs or integration packages, integration roadmaps. For several years, the Belarusian regime, Belarusian authorities have been resisting adopting them, but in 2021, they had to sign them. Uh, the military bases that are labeled as the uh, military training centers involved the presence of the Russian military uh, military equipment and those. Also the recognition of Crimea as being Russian. And another example of the economic sphere is that uh, the oil products were directed from the Lithuanian ports into the Russian ports. I don't know what will happen with the potash fertilizers in the future, but the following scenario, the similar scenario is possible. A number of the directions where Belarus has been resisting uh, the Russian influence 
Belarusian authorities have been making accept concessions there. Oh, well, I believe that the next thing that we will see is the, the trend to resist. At the same time, we cannot say that it is the Moscow that controls the situation in Belarus. Those Lukashenko has been and remains the, the main decision maker in the country. He has not submitted any main leverages to the Kremlin. I uh, believe that the contents of the constitutional amendments that he promised to Putin in September 2021 will be different uh, to the ones that we will see in the near future. There will be not to the pleasure of Russia. I believe I believe Russia will want to see it in a different light. I don't believe that uh, Lukashenko is following the Russian scenario 100%. I want to end my presentation on the positive note. Despite the unprecedented amount of repression mentioned by many here that we have seen happening over the 18 months, Alexander Lukashenko, uh, people surrounding him have not felt safe. They're still not sure that if they stop the repressive machine, they'll be able to control the situation. And it uh, breeds and it leads to a vicious circle where the more uh, enemies the authorities uncover, the more enemies they have, which means that they mustn't stop. It's difficult to say what stabilized, um, destabilized the situation more. The potential weakening of the repression at some point or the indefinite rep repeat. They're repeating. It's not clear when Lukashenko or will he ever give up the repression. It's also a very important factor because repression is effective in the short term. And we surely don't know what uh, the short term is, but looking far ahead in the long term, the repression is not something that Lukashenko can rely on indefinitely. The discussions that we've had in the expert community on the Belarusian society show that nothing is over yet. Lukashenko's actions confirm this. In this sense, the main, this is the main positive trend in 2021, as I see it. Thank you very much, Pavel. Indeed, we see that a vicious circle. The fact that Lukashenko's regime will understand how to st stop it is not guarantees, but now I. Uh, Uh, moving towards the second part of our session, where we will try to be more concise than in the first part. I think we'll be moving in the same order. I'd like to remind you um, the announced questions. I don't want everyone to answer each and every question. I'd like to remind you that we are talking about the future. Will there be any punishment for thought crimes? Will it be a pur the purge of the purgists? Because we mentioned today the system is looking for internal enemies. Or should we expect a, a full stop in 2022? Wanted to talk about the referendum at the beginning of the transition. It will happen in less than two months. We'll hear Katerina about the expert miracle and the foreign debt. We'll talk about the reaction of the West. 
and uh, what is Russia is capable of achieving will be the next question. The last question is what Tikhanovsky and other opponents of the regime can offer in terms of their possible strategies. Vadim, I suggest you focus on something before giving floor to each speaker. I think we should start with Andrei Kozakevich. We'll talk about the near future, about the referendum, the transit of power, the transition. Do you think it will uh, form the framework? Do you want to add something about anything else? Please, Andrei, the floor is yours. What did I expect to happen at the referendum? I expect a lot. I just want to see the test of the new constitution, among other things. What are my forecasts? Obviously, there will be an attempt to undertake a deep or promote a deep constitutional reform. It has already started because what we're witnessing regarding the repression is part of this process announced a long time ago. There'll be an attempt to more, a lot will depend on the transition period because the change in the constitution can be moved uh, one or three years. Then we'll have some timeless period. This way or another, there will be an attempt to create a new political system. The field has been purged and cleared. Uh, it will be followed by an attempt to build the public sector using the patriots, using the terminology of the authorities. The political field will have the same fate. Again, for the patriots, we remain similar policies will be seen in the state apparatus and so on. The movement towards this system, which will be on the one hand pluralistic, will not be a purely a Kazakh model, more of a Russian model that will be copied or something resembling the situation in Burma. If they succeed, there'll be a movement towards this, some initiatives implemented, but in many ways they will uh, come across the situation when Lukashenko will not be ready to launch it. Since tw 2007, we've uh, heard about attempts to launch uh, political party, a new political party supporting Lukashenko, but it hasn't happened yet. Many initiatives connected with the political reforms, including the constitutional reform, will have the same future. A uh, factor that can influence the situation uh, is the influence of Russia. This factor will be promoting some political changes. There'll be some transition mechanism outlined. What else can be said about the politics? The two more things. The first is about the politicization. It has been mentioned here that by Artyom Shaiban that it's going down. I believe it's based on the Chatham House research, predominantly. But there are many other research papers that 
show that uh, the change has been about 10 percent. Many people who are asked the question of who you support, they uh, decline to answer. And uh, the interest of people towards politics has gone down about 10 percent. Like, let's not argue what happened in the past. Let's talk about the future alone. This is exactly what I'm talking about. The level of politicization, politicizing is becoming very high. Considering that 2020 was the year of election. The main mystery here is why the authorities are supporting this. This trend will persist in 2022, despite this traditional strategy was connected with the depoliticizing. The level of political resistance and discussion inside the society will remain quite high. On the one hand, we'll see a, a political reform that will probably not be a success. On the other hand, the, the society will remain heavily politicized. That's how I see the next year in the political sense. Thank you, Andrei. Katerina, please focus on the, the so-called export miracle. And also, could you touch upon the sovereign debt crisis? It was already mentioned that uh, many people had their hopes of failing that the economy will undermine the regime. The next hope is in the sovereign debt crisis. Can Belarus pay off the sovereign debt without the external loan? Next year, we all understand that just like 2021 showed that Belarus is a, has a relatively closed economy affected very much by what is happening in the outside world. We saw that if the outside conditions are very favorable, super favorable, our economy will grow only 2%. We don't know if the super favorable conditions remain in 2022. We don't see that uh, the situation will worsen. We see the export is going down, but the foreign currency profits are still high. Without a doubt, it bought some time for the regime in terms of the possibility of servicing the sovereign debt without the foreign loans. In 2021, we increased foreign currency and gold reserves, basically did not spend and not touch the amounts accumulated by the Ministry of Finance. Last year, we were trying to answer the same question. If Belarus would be ready to pay off its sovereign debt last year, the chance was smaller. And after the export miracle happened, we are now more prepared to the payouts in 2022, indeed, it's about 3.5 billion, but we have over 4 billion of liquid assets in live currency, and we have um, 4.5 more in other liquidity assets. So obviously, the different things may happen. Oh, in 2020, we saw that the population was putting its hand on the forex reserves, but uh, 
could contribute to its increase. Uh, but one thing is clear, we um, resisted the foreign threats quite successfully. And um, whatever happens, Russia will help us to refinance this form of sovereign debt. It became obvious in 2021. The main vulnerability now, considering the fact that Russia will help us anyways, uh, we may not be given the 3.5 billions that we're asking for, but we don't really need them right away. The only vulnerability remaining is the debt chain that the state enterprises have and the desire of the authorities to launch the institutional cycle that has not been launched yet and they could lead to some sort of uh, mistakes in the economic policy which could lead to the financial crisis this is a more realistic scenario if we want to guess what we could lead to you know, an economic crisis but i would say that the economy is one of the fields where is the field of normality currently they will hold on to it will do their best to keep this normality even if sanctions start working they will be supporting the, doing that they were doing their best uh, by passing the sanctioned field um, tapping into resources from Russia in order to keep this image of economic stability I guess in the next year um, the worst case scenario will have a minus one percent of recession indeed it may be a recession but will not be something unexpected for Belarusians, not something they're not used to. Indeed, Belarusians uh, are difficult to impress by this. Artyom, uh, let's touch upon two things, the future of the repression. How long can, can this convey a uh, work, where will it go? Repression against the society or against the system? I mean, system trying to find more internal enemies. And the second point will touch upon Russia. How will, will the Russian actions affect, negatively affect the Belarusian sovereignty? Or will it boil down to some recognitions like uh, that of Crimea. <laughs> I'll do my best. Thank you, Vadim. As to the repression, it's difficult to forecast and to predict what will happen. Uh, considering that my ideas could become the prompt to the, for the authorities. Indeed, the uh, institutionalized structures of the civil society subject to repression uh, coming to an end like the platformers the schod and some independent journalists are still there but there are not many more targets for repression they need to go down at the level of individual activists or the people who are former protesters former observers or people who seen in the, meet, in the meetings or in the internal purges uh, could be against the society or the system because the society consists of the people from the system among other things in uh, breast office uh, of uh, of the um, those in railways if it has 25 percent of its staff sacked it will suffer we know that this more than 50 percent of the adults are employed by the state agencies and state authorities it will happen more before the referendum prior to referendum um, 
even though there are no obvious threats to the that could lead to destabilization of the situation after the referendum unless some unpredicted irritant emerging a bit in foreign sanctions external or internal incidents we could uh, again breach a plateau that we witnessed in in autumn because the major criminal cases have already been uh, have ended and court hearings in the soviet union 1930s Uh, had the next phase after repression flowing into the self-consumption when the system uh, had all the toolkit and had no checks the people tr started to solve their own personal problems personal issues in the business circles and the so on they were doing that using the the same toolkit uh, used to repress their position in 1990s it was done towards the criminal authorities then uh, they switched to a position activist here uh, they started with the right police this person uh, the protest and recording uh, the videos when people say they're sorry now they are it's uh, this is spreading recently we saw a video of person violating the law you know uh, drunk driver or something one of the factors why the repression may end it will happen when uh, it will touch upon too many members of the society, particularly those members that are, that are part of the system. These are the tracks and the trends that will persist. We found ourselves in an interesting situation in 2008, in 2014, the foreign policy, the regional situation became a background influence in the situation while in the past the non-stability provoked by russia pushed lukashenko towards some dialogues with uh, europe the west now the effect could be the opposite escalation in uh, uh, ukraine uh, could give lukashenko the feeling that he could jump on that escalation wagon so that he could sell to russia his political and military loyalty uh, the concessions in terms of the military training centers recognition of crimea and the joint exercises the bombers flying around uh, an ad hoc uh, military drills at the border of Ukraine, a placement of uh, new weapons within the borders of Belarus. Here, Belarus is switching uh, to the, on the one hand, to this painless elements, on the other hand, uh, is contributing to the regional instability. It could give him um, a feeling that he is more sure of himself inside the country so honestly just like uh, one or two three years ago i'm not expecting any progress in the uh in the framework of the integration roadmaps and other phobias that are spread in belarus in terms of the institutional integration with russia and i believe that integration with Russia is happening through the ad hoc 
industrial reorientation of experts. Trade and some logistics schemes, banking sphere is also affected by it and will be affected even more as the sanctions against the Belarusian uh, economic sector kick in. And the same is true about the military field. Belarus is serving the Russian military instead of playing a bridge. Thank you, Artem. Also notice uh, that video. Uh, when uh, a person was saying sorry, he was detained for drink, drunk driving. He was wearing a, a T-shirt bought in the symbol WY shop. Remember, it reminded me of the situation in Russia when the detained officials uh, would, uh, were detained for bribery are also covered in the same way by the authorities as they weren't by the opposition circles. We move on. We'll ask Petr Rutkovsky to concentrate on the issues of what the new strategies for Tikhanovsky could be and for other opponents of the regime. What we'll be able to do in 2022, considering the fact that there are some successes of foreign policy, area but I, we understand it doesn't all boil to diplomacy what do you think could be expected from them what they could do i did not expect this question although it was announced earlier indeed the keep uh, Keeping the importance and a being a political subject is very important. After the significant political campaign, Tikhanovsky managed to keep its importance. We'll, I think it will, will continue in 2022. I don't know what the situation will how the station will develop in 2022. When, the, of course, there are some campaigns like a referendum campaign, the boycott, uh, IT specialist joining this campaign. There's a small chance that This will result in what happened in 2020. However, we understand that this attempt is important and could be used. What will happen next? Uh, Freedom Day. I don't think much will change then. I don't think uh, the, oppo the opponents of the regime, including Tchadnovska, will uh, urge people to participate in the general strike, as was mentioned already. The question uh, arose if the society is still heavily politicized. I will remind you of 2019 when uh, in BISS we published uh, the analysis of experience that those have in terms of democracy, and we um, noted a relatively high demand for democracy. And some people were skeptical. They said they don't see any democratic changes. It is a problem that uh, an issue has, uh, is latent in its nature. Of course, based on the proper hypothesis, we can predict what will happen. 
but there must appear some factors that could lead uh, to the demand for democracy being more obvious. Indeed, we saw that it is there. Something similar will happen with the politics, this politicizing thing. What the next, what will be the next thing that prompt uh, uh, the new mutiny is unclear, is the category of the notorious black swans. It's difficult to predict this probability. Well, we'll hope this will happen as, as history shows. The chances they do come up. We don't know how and when it will happen, but hopefully it will happen. Thank you, Piotr. I'd like to ask Anais Marin to focus on the potential reaction from coming from the West. What we should expect in 2022? Will we see any more packages of sanctions, more serious that we had before, or will it be an attempt to, to temp tentatively start a dialogue with the regime? An attempt not to discredit itself. What kind of trend will we witness? Or will it be both? No crystal ball, so I, I'm afraid to, I won't risk uh, any kind of prognosis. And, and there are a lot of unknowns also at the EU level. Just to remind, there's a new government in Germany. We're going to have uh, election year in France, which is uh, now uh, having the uh, rotating presidency of the council. So uh, many things can, can happen also within the EU. And I don't think that there is a total understanding again as to what it should be the strategy which should be um, the level of, of, of dialogue at the topic uh, from my viewpoint of course the only uh, issue to be discussed is the question of when uh, the uh, political prisoners are going to be released and rehabilitated it, it should be as usual the uh, number one issue on the table but again there are some pragmatists opportunists um, populists inside the EU proper who can advocate another uh, approach which could be less principled. Uh, about the EU, I would say nonetheless that I feel that there is a bigger awareness and this is the result of the 2021. Uh, there's better awareness of the risks of the um, of the threat that Mr. Lukashenko is able to waive to try and destabilize the EU. Uh, I think this year has been uh, an important wake up, uh, has given a wake up call for, for uh, many EU countries as to what exactly is sharp power uh, when you know the, the the power of the of the weaker, those who cannot use either soft power or hard power, they will use this uh, sharp instrument and Mr. Lukashenko it seems will stop at nothing and here I would like to um, remind that uh, maybe we should uh, listen to what he's saying because unfortunately he seems to say what he will do and do what he says. Uh, he had warned about the uh, instrumentalization of, of migrants uh, back in the spring. Uh, let's listen to the other threats that he's made in recent months. Um, Migrants is just one example of how you can destabilize the EU, but uh, smuggled goods. Look at the situation with smuggled cigarettes at, at the, at the uh, Belarusian-Lithuanian border. Um, it, it can be real terrorists, as we know, the, most of the migrants who were uh, massing at, at the border were uh, themselves victims of human rights violations in their own country and, and seeking protection. Uh, however, there might be also a, a willingness to destabilize the EU by sending specific uh, type of, of migrants who would be nearer to the Islamic uh, Islamist groups or, or other willing to destabilize uh, the EU. And among the latest threats that I think is, should be taken extremely seriously 
is uh, the, uh, the, the the will expressed by Mr. Lukashenko to go after the extremists wherever they may be, including abroad. Uh, again, we have seen it uh, uh, with the with the uh, arrest uh, of Mr. Protasevich. But I am wondering uh, to what extent can you, my dear friends, abroad in in uh, Warsaw, in Vilnius, in Kiev, in Tbilisi, feel safe? Uh, because, uh, unfortunately, uh, with the help of um, other intelligence services, uh, the government of Belarus can can actually um, uh, turn words into deeds and go after the people which it considers, the government considers, as um, uh, disloyal, extremist, dangerous. And just as an example of the... Uh, the vision that the government has of human rights. Uh, the the there is a plan to amend the constitu the, the legislation so as to deprive uh, these people of their citizenship. Um, I mean, no one can be deprived in such a way of his own citizenship unless he or she has another. And as we know, those who have carta polaca or an opportunity to to work or get a residence permit in, in, in Poland, for example, will not necessarily become a, re, a, a citizen of Poland. And there is no reason whatsoever why they should be deprived of their um, Russian citizenship, if not for the reason which I believe the, the, the objective that Mr. Lukashenko is uh, pursuing with this approach is to continue purging society so that there will, will remain only loyalists, including loyal voters, who would be called to um, to endorse the uh, announced uh, constitutional reform? And uh, on that last matter about the constitution uh, um, and, and and referendum, um, I, I, maybe I'm not uh, updated properly, but. Has anybody seen the text, the actual text uh, of the uh, amend? Okay, the proposed amendment. Well, nobody has, and including not the uh, the Venice Con Commission, which has been in the past involved very seriously. So it's a joint organization from OSC and Council of Europe, which has been involved in in, in submitting opinions on on previous uh, texts. So with this not on the table with the issue of reforming the electoral system prior to, to organizing any other uh, consultation. This is not on the table either, electoral reform. I mean, the opposition is, is drafting um, very good uh, uh, amendments in new electoral code, etc. But uh, the government itself, in spite of uh, changing one, uh, the, the, the head of the uh, Central Electoral Commission, has done nothing to comply with international standards for organizing clean elections and clean electoral processes. So this, uh, in, in my view, we should I see this as a topic of, of interest for the community, for the epistemic community, Belarusians, you know, this reform, constitutional reform. But I believe that uh, Western analysts should not uh, grant any kind of attention to this process because it is not a, a, a legitimate process in the way it is uh, being announced and planned and eventually in the way it will be done again again with a significant part of the population being in forced exile and potentially uh, um, impeached, well, prevented from voting. I'm afraid that they, many of you will not dare this time to go to the Belarusian embassy to cast your ballot, right? For fear of being arrested because the Belarusian embassy would be uh, the territory of Belarus. So potentially you can also be arrested there for extremism uh, and extradite back to, to, to Belarus. So I'll stop here and I apologize in advance. I'm in an airport and, and it's uh, the, the actually the Wi-Fi connection keeps on uh, uh, cutting. So I will gladly take some questions if I'm still in line. Otherwise, well, best wishes <laughs> and see you next year. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, thanks a lot, Naïs. And thank you that you are, you are connected today. We understand your difficult uh, logistics station. But thank you for your participation and for your input. And of course, see you, see you of course next year in our discussions. Uh, right, so I uh, now will give floor to Pavel uh, Lunkin. We mostly covered all the issues, but since you uh, will be speaking last, you will have the privilege to select the point to touch upon. I think out of the a list that I was provided. Uh, we uh, haven't touched upon the strategy of Tikhanovska. I guess the question 
was like what kind of strategies they may entertain. I guess somebody touched upon this, Piotr did, but uh, you can speak about this on foreign policy and other things. I believe that in this direction, we shouldn't expect much new. I would say that uh, the main task that needs to be tackled by Svetlana Tikhanovska and uh, people surrounding her and other people who want to be politically active in Belarus is the to keep its political importance and uh, at least at the level they have now. If we analyze the visits of Svetlana around the world, at least she visited the majority of the allies of the West. Uh, what remains? Uh, she can go back there again and discuss the same things in a more relevant light. But theoretically, in case uh, the situation um, deteriorates significantly, I mean, economic situation, Uh, she can criticize more the Belarusian authorities. And I believe that uh, she may help try to explain to Belarusian citizens that uh, it's all uh, because of the regime. That's what they're trying to do now, but they're lobbying the sanctions against the regime mostly. And they're try collecting the support for Belarusian media outlets and Belarusian civil organizations. They were not uh, really successful at the external field. I uh, believe in 2022, if uh, there are more favorable conditions, the headquarters may use this opportunity. Could you add something on the foreign policy? Lukashenko's regime, because a lot has been said about his opponents, which is understandable. It was um, much more interesting to watch the foreign policy activities of Tikhanovska than that of Mackay. But the curtails of the embassies, what will it lead to? Will it lead to the nothing more opening in Europe or what? I would note several things here. It's not the first time that the restructuring of the foreign office is happening. After each deep crisis um, towards the Western countries, uh, the MFA was trying to move their diplomat to some other regions. I'm sure that this will not pay any, play any major role here. Uh, we're not talking about the embassy closures. We're talking about the cut down the number of staff and possibly the some embassy ambassadors going back to Minsk and Bill is being represented by the charge d'affaires or I think the major effect that restructuring could have on Belarus is the increase of the number of diplomatic mission staff in China. There are some economic prospects. Economic relationships is developing very fast. And in the past, the number of the Belarusian diplomats in China was not in the par with the expectations that the Belarusian authorities have. In this respect, it could play a positive role, but only in terms of relationship with China and cooperation with China. If we talk about the African region, for example, this is not applicable. This is not relevant. Without a doubt, there could be some gray black schemes, but they're already working now. Uh, I don't expect that our diplomats will be moved there. 
and uh, I don't think there will be any good results from that if uh, this happens. Thanks. Well, I guess we have touched upon all the questions announced. Well, it's high time uh, for other members of our discussion to join, uh, join in it. I already see Valery Karbanevich and others. Traditionally, I don't see all of the members of the discussion. So those of you who would like to comment on the 2021 and the prospects of 2021, please raise your hands. We'll give floor to everyone. I already see Valery Ivanovich Karbalevich. Please, the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Uh, wish everyone uh, the good holidays. As to the next year, according to the latest statements of Lukashenko, the early election will not be conducted. I think it has to do with the fact that Russia has stopped to push Lukashenko and that on this. And it happened because Lukashenko is in the tough diplomatic and uh, military conflict with the West. And it is Lukashenko who Lukash Russia needs to destabilize the region as the only proper ally of Russia in this conflict. Therefore, Putin changed his mind. At least they're postponing the power transfer process in Belarus and is ready to agree to Lukashenko staying in power. In this sense, we're uh, an interesting collision arises in terms of institutional reform. The constitutional reform from the very beginning came up as an element of uh, the power transit project. Now, as uh, it, it has been suspended, the question arises why this new constitution and the reform is needed. For, uh, judging by uh, what is happening, the referendum will take place and the contradiction here is that the new constitution, according to the information that appeared earlier, limits the powers of the president. So it happens that if the new constitution comes into force after the referendum in uh, February, Lukashenko in the next 3.5 years will, be, uh, will have his powers curtailed. It's difficult to imagine Lukashenko in this role, to be honest. If we uh, imagine that uh, Lukashenko will elect himself as the head of the All-Belarusian Council, this um, model is questionable. The second scenario shows that uh, in 2025, well, when the absurd situation rises, the new referendum passed and then will be enforced after 3.5 years. The question is why hold the referendum in 2021? It will be more logical to hold it at the beginning of the 2025 so that, that it will come into power after the election. So it happens that if uh, the early election is not conducted. I mean, the presidential election, there, there's no real sense in implementing the reform in February 2022. But we're so much used to the absurdities that Belarusians will not be embarrassed by that. I'm surprised by that. Thank you, Valery Ivanovich. It's hard to see the political logic here. Uh, 
but I guess there is some logic to this madness that maybe we don't know much. I thought, do we have any more raised hands? I don't see any of them really. I believe those of you who are with us could add something if you want, or we'll be moving towards the wishes for the new year, something that we want to find under the fir tree or to find something under 20, under the fir tree in 2022. Are there any more wishes, uh, uh, remarks about the forecast? Do our main speakers have anything to add? That has not been mentioned by others. Andrei Katerina, do you want to add something? No more wish, no wishes for me, but I believe what can really affect the situation in Belarus, based on what has been said, I believe there are two factors. The fact is that could be highlighted is the economic situation. This fact in one as Katerina rightly said, it could um, make a serious blow in the system and uh, for situation when this or that direction. The second is what Valeria mentioned, the stalemate between uh, the Russia and the West or confrontation there, it's not particularly stable. It's not, we well, should remember the the meeting of Putin and Biden. This embassy was totally different there. They said they could reach to some agreements and uh, come up with some plans. Now we see Russia coming up with ultimatums. It's hard to predict what will happen in 2022. It couldn't turn anyways. Of the factors that are obvious here, these two will define the, the political development of Belarus in the upcoming year. I think we should follow them closely. That's it for me. Thank you, Andre. Indeed. Why, what should be the main thing that require our attention in 2022? Some integration maps. What else should warrant our attention in 2022? What other indicators that should uh, be used by the experts? will follow in the same order. Katerina, there are a lot of interesting figures in the economy. Belarusian usually following the currency exchange rate of the Belarusian ruble to US dollar. Indeed, uh, it has been quite dynamic, the currency rate. I would follow the expert figures. This is something that we are interested in these days. Unfortunately, we see that and the authorities have not been shown to us the expert figures of sanctioned goods over the last six months. I think we should also follow the figures of financial stability the foreign exchange assets, forex, and also integration map. As to the integration maps, I would not uh, follow the text. I guess there are a lot of technical details and intricacies and not much of substance based on what has been announced. I agree. Uh, I believe there will be 95% of it 
covered by the technical details. But I'm confused by the fact that if we understand it's 95% made of technical details, they shouldn't be hidden. So the more they hide it, the more mysterious it becomes for the public. Well, anyway, let's wait for it to be made public. Artyom, what will you be following in the upcoming year? Apart from the press club events, you mean? Yes, I will be inviting you more often. I guess uh, just like it happened in 2021, we're witnessing now happening in the region what we could not predict several months ago. I mean, uh, this confrontation between the NATO and Russia, I'm sure it will be the same in the next year, some black swans and something we could not predict. I also believe that it's important to see what will happen at the end of uh, this year, the publishing of the constitution because the transition state is the most important thing here they will tell us about the time frame that lukashenko has in his head it will mean nothing or it will not mean too much from the point of view what will really happen it could be updated reviewed and some emergencies could be found uh, in order to put off the introduction period but we will understand the basic plan the basic scenario that is subject to change, but is there. Uh, otherwise, the, the next year could become the year of the bifurcation point that we mentioned uh, about um, an hour ago. In other words, it will be the system eating itself, consuming itself. This regime, when the and the church is total, it will be unpleasant for many players. It's all very sad to watch for me as a Belarusian, but as an analyst, I find it very interesting because so far the repression has never stopped uh, for any reason by, but the personal ones, personal decisions. And now the dynamics looks to be very internal. Why? Because it will be followed by a forced transformation, rebalancing of the system mentioned by what Andre mentioned. Indeed, the balance changed in a cardinal way. But recently I saw an, an interesting lecture on how the Soviet state was ending the big terror of 1937 and 1938. They were doing their best not to break the new balance of the NKVD role. The same experiment will probably be implemented by Lukashenko. Uh, considering the fact that it uh, overlapping with uh, regional stability and uh, weak legitimacy inside the country or that of Lukashenko. I mean, uh, we're up to a black swan. I guess we're in for a black swan. I think uh, Lukashenko overestimates the number of the um, platforms the regime can rely upon inside the country behind this curtain. Uh, so uh, I will support it metaphorically. I believe it's the asphalt that is uh, as a wet ground beneath it. And looking from the top, we think it's like any other asphalt at the highway. But in fact, if we go deeper, if uh, some things go weaker, it will the dynamic will be fast. I and mean, then the situation will change much faster than we think could please could you please send us the link to the kvd related lecture that you mentioned 
Anais, uh, if you're still with us, could you say a few things to us? I can see Anais. Again, what uh, should we follow in terms of repression? Apart from the number of the political prisoners that keep up being updated, how will the st stance of the West will change towards what is happening in Belarus? And are there any important processes in the West that we should understand in order to predict the direction of the West? Anais, please unmute yourself. Anton, can you turn the microphone so it will be faster? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think it's important to know uh, what is happening between Minsk and the United Nations because this year we had a crisis in relationship. You probably know that human rights advisor. Senior human rights advisor. Sorry, I switched to English. Uh, has been uh, uh, PNG declared uh, non grata in, in in Minsk and exposed. Uh, afterwards, there has been um, uh, in the Belarus was was quoted uh, extensively in the report of the um, Secretary General dedicated to cases of retaliation against human rights defenders for cooperating with uh, uh, UN human rights mechanisms after which uh, the government um, and embarked in a sort of, uh, again, retaliation against the whole UN system and including a smear campaign against Mr. Guterres himself on, on Belgian uh, TV and all the rest. So plus then the, the situation with the, with the migrants and well, I've not been involved in, in this because there is a special rapporteur on the rights of migrants who has been uh, sending uh, letters to both uh, the government of Poland and the government of Belarus. But uh, Belarus is not cooperating at all. I mean, there's nothing new here. But what I can suspect, and that would be my prognosis, it's not very optimistic for next year, is again, more retaliation on the part of the authorities against the mechanisms, the international mechanisms and, and, the, and the neighbors that, uh, that the government doesn't like or has problem with. In the same vein, as I suspect there will be more targeted repression against people, uh, against Belarusians, included, uh, including outside of the borders of the country. I suspect that there would be um, more a, a greater tendency, a clearer tendency to always uh, uh, let the situation rot evolve into an open conflict with Lithuania, with Poland, with Ukraine, and potentially with uh, UN uh, mechanisms as well. I mean, there, I, can, I cannot see how with Mr. Lukashenko staying in position and nothing changing in his policy, anything could improve in the government's uh, foreign relations, including with the UN system. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Anais. Thank you, Anais. Indeed, my impression in the last uh, year, this year, and judging by the news about the, the United States Embassy uh, and Belarus. I started thinking, you know, when will we start um, retaliating against the um, MOM and the United Nations agencies? So I also believe that the, there's a chance that such repressions may happen. And the person authorities keep surprising us in this respect. Who else is there? Pavel, I believe Piotr wants to add something. I will personally will be following the political situation in uh, Tunisia. Piotr is a happy man. 
currently I don't uh, foresee any serious process in Belarus, but uh, at the same time, I've been subjective here. I just uh, want to relieve the deja vu. Since uh, May, June last year, when after the primaries of the right wing forces, uh, I, uh, I thought that more important issues would lie in the sphere of healthcare, like the pandemic and so on that the electoral processes were not that significant. Then my wife reminded me in June and in May that some serious things were stirring up. So I followed the political situation in Tunisia and my wife hopefully may give me a wake up call and say, look at what's happening in front of your nose, in front of your eyes. Thank you, Piotr, indeed. Please follow the announcement of the our club session for that. Pavel, what else should we follow, do you think? Uh, I think we'll end our discussion with this. We promised to say something nice at the end. Hopefully, uh, indeed, this will happen. I, will, I may say that the upcoming year will will be happen on the background of the political transfer system transformation. So I'll try to understand what the changes in the political and the constitution will be. Uh, I agree that, and Anjay started with this. Obviously we enter in the stage when the political system will be system sustain the transformation. What kind of transformation will be is unclear. I shouldn't really give up any forecast about where Lukashenko will move if he leaving to leave his position. Um, will he remain the president? I'm not sure that he has made the decision for himself. If we, even if we see the changes, it's, I'm not sure that the life will not force him to review his attitude, because as we know, in politics, the institutional powers are not so important. It is the de facto political influence that matters most. In this case, it will be very difficult to um, compete with Lukashenko even though even if he doesn't have any illegal uh, um, ways to influence the situation. Secondly, the dynamics of repression will show us, will give us a sign of what Belarus and authorities expect from its relation, their relationships with the West. If they really uh, happy with the dialogue, with the new normality, without any attempts to somehow improve the situation for the civil society, will it become the new normality, considering the lessons of the 2020, or is uh, just trying to put everything in the asphalt and then feel himself sure, but to give more concessions to the West and to sell it there. These are my two points that I wanted to touch. So you promised to say something nice at the end, but uh, you mentioned asphalt, unfortunately. As here I would like to wish that uh, in 2020, as a result of the various uh, events we'll be able to make conclusions in 2020, sitting in the press club office, uh, that everyone uh, in prison now will 
free, Valeria Castigova, among others, co-organizer of uh, an uh, analytical club sessions. She is still in the Volodarskova prison. We all wish that she walks free soon. We all want to hope that raise our glasses to the new Belarus. That uh, will happen eventually. Well, the wishes are not forecast in this respect. But this is the picture that I want to enter the new year with. I want to wish everyone to have enough power and resilience to keep on working and keep on hanging there to meet in the sessions of the analytical clubs. <laughs>